just a little background about him. Uh, he is uh, married and has four sons. In 1993, uh, the ambassador joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where he was instrumental in achieving Lithuania ascension into NATO and the European Union. Between 1993 and 2009, he has held various high-level positions in the Lithuania MFA, most focused on Lithuania's relationship with the European Union. Most recently, Ambassador Pavlionis acted as the Ambassador-at-Large and Chief Coordinator for Lithuania's Presidency of the Community of Democracies and Chief Coordinator for Transatlantic Relations. He has a Master's Degree in Philosophy and a PhD in Political Science and he has pursued both degrees in Vilnius University, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yeah, it's perfect. Lithuania. So please welcome him. Ambassador. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, this is the first time for me in this forum. Uh, uh, I just, you know, maybe a month ago I met uh, your representatives and uh, I was inspired by, by the idea of dialogue between different cultures and religions uh, because, uh, well, as we discussed, uh, Lithuania historically was the place uh, uh, of dialogue uh, between different cultures and religions. Uh, we, our state was big and great in the Middle Ages. John Paul II was calling it the European Union of the Middle Ages. But we have uh, we had different, uh, different uh, cultures and religions inside, like some colleagues are joking, even today in Vilnius we have more churches than gasoline stations. Uh, so uh, ecumenism, for example, like a phenomenon, uh, uh, was born by Lithuanian Knights uh, mm -hmm. who created uh, first uh, uh, unities uh, between Orthodox and Catholic churches. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I thought that I will make this presentation uh, from kind of Lithuanian perspective, mm -hmm. uh, uh, discuss a bit uh, and brief you on achievements as we see of Lithuanian current European Union presidency, but then go back and make some more personal uh, yeah, observations about about this uh, dialogue and and uh, and bridges we try to, to build. Um, and, and also to speak a bit about the European Union as such. Uh, uh, I, I shouldn't hide, I just defended my doctoral thesis about exactly this uh, item, dialogue, cultures, religions, and, and kind of clashes of civilizations in the European Union, how far we can go and uh, what are the limits. So I will also try to use it like for the dialogue with you if possible, trying maybe to provoke a bit. Right, right. Uh, so uh, from Lithuanian perspective, uh, from kind of historical view, uh, what I learned uh, as a diplomat and as a person, uh, as a student uh, studying uh, history and uh, different kind of cultural developments, we've been great and big uh, when we've been kind of ecumenical. Uh, our empire was lasting for 500 years. Uh, well, it's quite a period in Europe, yes. uh, especially. Uh, so, uh, but with the nation state uh, in 18th century and 19th century emerging, uh, uh, with more kind of uh, narrow uh, perspective uh, emerging in the region, uh, our our state collapsed. Uh, not only for this reason. It's also because I think we've been most, you can say, American in the region uh, in 1791. We've been the first to uh, adopt American-inspired constitution with all the human dignities and liberties. And then we had the little plot of free empires who, who killed the state because mm -hmm. it was it was dangerous uh, 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 for the region. If mm. we are successful with those human dignities, with mm. those human dignities in the region, of course, um, impact might be yeah, quite negative for those empires. So, mm -hmm. uh, and again, now you can see with, with, with the European Union, you have the second try to build that atmosphere of tolerance of uh, unity of different differences uh, uh, so 
and that's quite successful for more than 50 years. Uh, and uh, we as Lithuanians, we are very happy to be part of it, and now even share the whole organization. But here I, I want to stop with this positive note and, and try to provoke a bit how far we can go right. with this model. We, from other side, and please allow me that skepticism, maybe that's the end of the presidency, so I can be a bit more free in my judgments and kind of a, bi a bit more academic. You know, we, from the other hand, we see kind of enlargement fatigue in the European Union. Mm -hmm. Why it is happening? We, we see the process with Turkey started in 63 or 64, if I remember well, with your first uh, uh, application to European Union. Why it is going for so long? Mm -hmm. We see also a uh, kind of internal soul searching with, you know, from Euro crisis to, uh, yeah, to different kind of strategies what, that we try to find and we're not finding. So how far this empire will go? Uh, will it stay? Will it crawl? Or will it, you know, become more effective? And here I have a uh, few kind of critical remarks that I think are important uh, and that here I go really to more individual uh, yeah, kind of statements. Uh, I think we are big and powerful. We are 500 million already and mm -hmm. uh, 28 uh, member states. Uh, but uh, when we grow we meet a lot of different cultures and religions and we do not actually ready for that encounter. Uh, the problem with European construction that it is now more economic and technocratic. Mm -hmm. This cultural or civilizational level is kind of deleted from our construction. Though in the very beginning European Union was created like kind of, uh, well, club where we, you know, preserve the values, we fight, we invest into that. But now it's more economic and technocratic di dimension that is prevailing. Mm -hmm. So when we meet different different culture, we simply don't know what to do with it. We try to be very kind of superficial, we try to, uh, to, to apply different kind of uh, keys and, and instruments and programs, but do we understand the other? And in order to understand the other, you have to understand your own culture. But what if this culture is becoming uh, uh, well, what, is this, what if this culture is losing some kind of cultural dimension that, you know, that is a kind of like a bridge to another culture? If, if, uh, if churches are disappearing in, in Europe in general, mm -hmm. if, if, if European Union is re rejecting officially in Lisbon Treaty its Christian roots, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of identity we have? Mm -hmm. Those questions are usually not discussed in Brussels, and I think that's, that's one of the problem. I think we have to discuss it, because when you meet the other, you have to be ready for it. Uh, and you have to get this level uh, yeah, kind of used. Uh, but why do you think this is still prevailing? Because, you know, the European Union, the European states have been, you know, um, you know, fairly somewhat diversified. You know, immigrants are coming, um, if not, you know, on an equal status, but they're they're coming either as workers or. Um, but there has been diversity in Europe for quite some time. Um, but it this is still something that, um, as you said, you know, is an issue uh, that that seems to not be able to be jumped. I and think also comparing it with America, where I have a pleasure of living for. And just a little background about him. Uh, he is uh, married and has four sons. In 1993, uh, the ambassador joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where he was instrumental in achieving Lithuania ascension into NATO and the European Union. Between 1993 and 2009, he has held various high-level positions in the Lithuania MFA, most focused on Lithuania's relationship with the European Union. Most recently, Ambassador Pavlionis acted as the ambassador at large and chief coordinator for Lithuania's presidency of the Community of Democracies and chief coordinator for transatlantic relations. He has a master's degree in philosophy and a PhD in political science. 
and he has pursued both degrees in Vilnius University. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yeah, it's perfect. Lithuania. So please welcome him. Ambassador. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, this is the first time for me in this forum. Uh, uh, I just, you know, maybe a month ago I met uh, your representatives and uh, I was inspired by, by the idea of dialogue between different cultures and religions uh, because, uh, well, as we discussed, uh, Lithuania historically was the place uh, uh, of dialogue uh, between different cultures and religions. Uh, we, our state was big and great in the Middle Ages. John Paul II was calling it the European Union of the Middle Ages. But we have uh, we had different, uh, different uh, cultures and religions inside, like some colleagues are joking, even today in Vilnius we have more churches than gasoline stations. Uh, so uh, ecumenism, for example, like a phenomenon, uh, uh, was born by Lithuanian Knights uh, who created uh, first uh, uh, unities uh, between Orthodox and Catholic churches. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I thought that I will make this presentation uh, from kind of Lithuanian perspective, mm -hmm. uh, uh, discuss a bit uh, and brief you on achievements as we see of Lithuanian current European Union presidency, but then go back and make some more personal uh, observations about, about this uh, dialogue and, and, uh, and bridges we try to, to build. Um, and, and also to speak a bit about the European Union as such. Uh, uh, I shouldn't hide, I just defended my doctoral thesis about exactly this uh, item, dialogue, cultures, religions, and, and kind of clashes of civilizations in the European Union, how far we can go and uh, what are the limits. So I will also try to use it like for the dialogue with you if possible, trying maybe to provoke a bit. Right, right. Uh, so uh, from Lithuanian perspective, uh, from kind of historical view, uh, what I learned uh, as a diplomat and as a person, uh, as a student, uh, studying uh, history and uh, different kind of cultural developments, we've been great and big uh, when we've been kind of ecumenical. Uh, our empire was lasting for 500 years. Uh, well, it's quite a period in Europe, yes. uh, especially. Uh, so. Uh, but with the nation state uh, in 18th century and 19th century emerging uh, uh, with more kind of uh, narrow uh, perspective uh, emerging in the region uh, our our state collapsed uh, not only for this reason it's also because i think we've been most you can say american in the region uh, in 1791, we've been the first to uh, adopt American-inspired constitution with all the human dignities and liberties. And then we had the little plot of free empires who, who killed the state because mm -hmm. it, was, it was dangerous uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for the region. If mm -hmm. we are successful with those human dignities, with mm -hmm. those human dignities the region, of course, um, impact might be yeah, quite negative for those empires. So, mm -hmm. uh, last three years in mm -hmm. working, I think we are, s maybe we are still kind of young empire. Mm -hmm. in just 50 mm -hmm. years. What I observe here in America that I think is more effective in, in integration building. Uh, you invest here very much into that human level. You know, into, into education, into uh, into civil society building. You know, this state is great not only because of some kind of construction from above. This state is great because you invest into strong people. Right. And uh, you invest in, y your schools are strong, you invest into personality that is strong, mm -hmm. in personality that is open to speak with other culture. You know, I am diplomat. I was traveling with my own kids in different, and I what I see, what kind of reactions they have in Europe by integrating themselves. And here, they are different. Mm -hmm. Here, society is more open because you have that human level. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you study the European Union Aki seriously, mm -hmm. you have this human level kind of non-existent. 
social policy, education, maybe a bit, just a bit, uh, well, from health to, well, religions, cultures, no. It's simply not even statistic is available about mm. that. Please don't talk about that mm. because, yeah. well, it's kind of something that we take mm. out. Mm. We are, the, the beauty and power of Europe is in economy, in, in technocratic side of it. Mm. But I think in order to be successful, like uh, some of the freedom fighters from our region were telling, you know, it's okay, we, we, are, we are strong on everything, but what about the kind of European soul? What right. about the vision? What about the strategy? Is it existing? Do we know where we go? Do we know where are our limits? We are not ready for those questions. Yeah, really these impediments are coming from the states that are making up the European Union, as you said. You know, yeah. it's rather young, the, the uh, Union itself. And so, uh, but the, the states, uh, inability to jump these issues of integration and, and cultural awareness and di or diversity awareness, um, you know, I think, I mean, that that has been brought into, uh, but the goal of the European Union uh, itself is, is hopefully to go and to be diverse and to recognize different cultures and to be an open society uh, where everyone is, is seen as equal and, and valued uh, for, from their, where they're coming from. Yes and no. Uh as I said, in the beginning of European Union, it was very evident. Mm -hmm. And it is very evident with the tribes like us, mm -hmm. uh, with Central Europeans, with Baltic states, you know, tribes who have been just, you can say, after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. We know why freedom is important. We faced most cruel totalitarian right. regimes. We know why human dignity and democracy is important because, you know, every third is killed or deported and so on. Mm -hmm. So for us, there is no problem in explaining the importance of values and right. those issues. Right. But if you turn to all the member states, to West Europe, you know, when you speak values, when you speak democracy, it's some, they take it for granted. Of course it is, but you know, you do not invest into that. If you do not invest into that, this fact is disappearing from your agenda. Hmm. To be very honest, when I landed in Washington three years ago, I also was kind of a little bit shocked that democracy was not on the table here. Mm -hmm. For very different reasons, mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. internal politics, but I was chairing this community of democracy organization, and you know, I spent 70% you know, of my energy to, to, to reintroduce it back to an American policy with other you know, mm -hmm. worried ambassadors around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you have to invest into that. Sure. Can you imagine democracy like a file in European Union mm -hmm. uh, formally appeared just three or four years ago? It's just with Czech and Swedish presidencies who introduced democracy like a policy. Mm -hmm. And we still spend maybe just one or two percent of our development money for democracy building or human kind of type of building I I in general. So we are not so good with the things that, that should be important and without, and without which I don't think that we will be able to, to, uh, to, to kind of to continue in, in the same manner we, we can. If this empire want to be strong, uh, and I want to see that European Union as a strong, we have to reinvest into, I would say, in, in that human side of, of, of the European Union. We have to, we culture, and dialogue. Mm -hmm. The things your forum is so much concentrated on should be important for us. I don't, th I don't say that that should be a center mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of our kind of political agenda, but at least it should be an important part of it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we have orthodox countries already. Mm -hmm. Well, you see what is going on now in, in Ukraine mm -hmm. and what kind of European dilemmas they have. Are we ready, really, are we ready mm. as Europeans to face it? Mm. Can we really embrace those hundreds of thousands of Europeans trying to be Europeans with all the you know, problems and issues from the region? Are we really sincere about our support to Ukrainian you know, freedom, European vocation? Well, maybe, but not enough. Uh, so are we ready to face the Turkey? and its succession to European Union. Lithuanians, you know, 
during our presidency, we relaunched accession talks with Turkey after three years of, or so of kind of little uh, stalemate. I was also present uh, for the very long night in Luxembourg uh, ministerial meeting 10 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. I was deputy minister then, and I remember how difficult for Europeans was to take a decision on accession talks with Turkey. Why? Because we are not ready mm. for those questions. Mm. So we have to be serious with them. Uh, and uh, so the mere fact that something happened in Lisbon Treaty when we deleted Christianity from it, for me, it's not so glorious because it, it means you simply delete the cultural side of your agenda. Mm -hmm. Even if we are different, we have to speak about the differences. We have to spend time on that. We Absolutely. have to invest into mm. understanding of who we are and also what are the differences. Absolutely. Only then we will be able to build the bridges. If we are not speaking about that, if we delete it from our agendas, if we pretend that we are just economic and technocratic uh, 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 you know, uh, citizens of European Union, then you have all the traumas of unexpected. Then you have nationalism and radicalism, because those are unconscious kind of reactions, because you are not trained, you don't know how to face the differences, then you react in the most radical way. And especially now, after global economic crisis, uh, it's nice that we're dealing with economic and financial aspects of it. But it's very sad that we are not dealing with political and social consequences of crisis. Don't we see that, you know, radicalization of societies is ongoing everywhere? Don't we see that populism and nationalism is coming back? If we do not see it, we have a problem with our European constructions and transatlantic or any other dialogues. We have, you know, accidents then happen happening and, and traumas and, and dramas. So I'm not so sure that elites are ready to discuss it. I don't think so. Uh, it's just minority and those nice forums uh, who discuss it. Uh, but uh, I think if we are serious enough, uh, we have to do it. And on me, also on more positive note, well, still, we have Americans who are, I would say, uh, m well, more advanced with human dignity and, and and, and education and I would say human level of integration who are very serious about that. You have Central Europeans who suffered a lot and who, who've been the bloodlands you know, of, 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 of the world, you can say, per capita, the biggest numbers of martyrs you know, uh, to compare with all the ages and all the nations. You have you know, movements like yours. So I would say now we still have a chance to to reintroduce it like an agenda. Also looking now to those transatlantic trade talks between Americans and Europeans, it's nice, it's important. If we want to stay democratic, it's important to glue our economies, it's important to, to, to be together. But I think we sh have to use that trade union created to speak about all other issues to learn from each other, mm -hmm. even you know, Europeans learning from Americans, and maybe Americans learning from Europeans, Sorry. how do we deal with differences? You know, how, you know, when I meet Americans, they always say, do you know that a lot of terrorism actually is born in Europe, that after goes to America? Mm -hmm. Why? Because you do not know how to deal with differences. You are not doing it. You are not so good on that. Uh, Okay, so let's speak about that. Uh, let's speak about those issues who are kind of anathema um, for very different reasons. Uh, but uh, I think if we do it, if we use those uh, qualities of Central European Americans and you know people like you, maybe we have a chance. And then we can grow again. If not, what sad sadly happened after the Second World War, you know, Europeans, you can say, lost it. It, they lost it to Americans, they lost it to Russians, you know, and, and now we're trying to rebuild our kind of glory through economic means, but if we do not tackle those political, cultural, strategic things, if we do not have a vision where we go, I don't think that we, we grow. We might crawl one day. And, you know, some people are skeptical and waiting for that, 
uh, kind of Roman Empire I, to, to I grow. Think, I think what you have been saying and what you said a few minutes ago and the questions you know you pose to uh, the leaders or yourselves uh, within the European Union and then the issues that are being seen within these countries and uh, within this empire as you put it, uh, yeah, it is are issues here as well. I mean these are uh, issues that are from the economic issues, the fallout, you know, people contracting, uh, you know, kind of hunkering down, um, you know, when they're when they're in dire straits, you know, and and and, th and they have a sense of where where is this country going, you know, economically, especially when, you know, uh, your social institutions and you know, you're just your whole cultural way uh, of life is so so much embedded with uh, your economic way of life. This is what happens. This is the, the fallout. So how do you deal with that? And I think these are ongoing questions. And I also believe that this is, you know, these are questions, uh, robust questions that, that uh, need to be asked of, uh, within all democracies, you know, to be able to further your democracy because it's never perfect. Um, we're trying to perfect, uh, but, uh, you know, so. Uh, very good points. I, I want to just shift back to Lithuania um, and talk a bit about, um, because I'm very interested in the diversity of your country, um, uh, ethnic ethnically and uh, religiously uh, different groups. Can you talk a little bit about that and then the origins and um, so? So, well, we've been last pagan empire in, in, in Europe. So our uh, pagan knights in, in 13th century, they invited different religions and cultures to, to, to help them build the empire. Mm -hmm. So for very different re reasons, uh, Lithuania and my capital Vilnius was called Northern Jerusalem because mm -hmm. uh, it was a center of Jewish civilization. It was the biggest synagogues there. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, you know, different other religions who, who felt unsafe Mm -hmm. uh, in in Europe, uh, like old believers from Russia, uh, all Orthodox uh, churches, uh, Protestants, uh, uh, Muslims, uh, Karaites, Tatars, uh, mm -hmm. uh, they've been settling in. Uh, and uh, that's why in all our kind of constitutions uh, uh, and, and legal uh, norms, uh, uh, that uh, tolerance, religious tolerance, mm. was very important mm. uh, yeah, uh, because simply without it we wouldn't be able to keep that empire so big. Uh, and, uh, and uh, well, we try now to kind of rebuild those bridges uh, with different cultures and civilizations lost. Uh, but as I say, uh, well, it's, it's a hard work. Uh, it's, uh, well, in t I think the 20th century is the opposite hmm. of that tolerance and maybe the, the radical end of uh, kind of opposite development hmm. uh, with different totalitarian schemes marching in Europe. We are just 50, 60 years out of it. Hmm. So, you know, what did we actually learn from it? <coughs> if, if we go economic, <laughs> as you just told, if we consider us just like consumers, and uh, if we push only that pragmatic level, that is destroying what we have because our democracies are based on values. And for consumer type of relationship, there is no difference with whom and you know for what kind of reasons you make. Mm -hmm. You deal with dictatorships because you have good money, you know, you know, and they cooperate together. They have oil and other kind of different instruments, and they attack the democracies. So, uh, how do you strengthen, you know, the basic? foundations of your uh, of your you know, kind of democratic communities it's still a question that is unanswered i think okay. all right i think we had I saw the corner of my eye possibly some hands <laughs> raised <laughs> earlier uh, yes ma'am can you wait for the microphone thank you thank you
Yes. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, and I apologize for coming in part of late. late. Um, I wanted to ask you, given uh, some of the perches that Lithuania has been at most recently, the EU, and, and if this came up before I came in, please forgive me. Um, but looking ahead to the presidency of the UN, and I know your interest in accession to the OECD, what do you see as some of the particular challenges? I would say particularly as you approach the new year and the presidency uh, of, of the Security Council. Um, and uh, are there things that Lithuania particularly would like to accomplish? Well, I would still start with uh, the regional perspective because I think this, this Christmas will again be uh, kind of very much related with the events in Ukraine uh, as we are used to uh, to have for some time so I think if w one one of my colleagues was joking is it the kind of spring of Europe East is coming is it uh, though we have some results after Vilnius System Partnership Summit. We have important treaties signed with Georgians and Moldova, as well initialed, that will sooner or later will really bring those countries very close to European Union or maybe to the European Union. But those events in Kiev, they are of a real, real civilizational uh, importance. So I think that will take most of our energy mm -hmm. and of the world's energy in this part of the world because if they are successful in moving this European agenda together with the government in consensus that might change the European continent that will impact the whole region and Russia and all countries around without any doubt so that is most important for us on the other hand, of course, you know, uh, during Lithuanian presidency, well, different questions discussed. Syria, you know, Iran. Uh, we are we are still building our global capacities, but for example, after Arab Spring, and because of our very recent uh, democratic transition experience. We've been formally lo launching a lot of initiatives in, 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 in MENA region mm -hmm. because, you know, we just did it. Mm -hmm. And we, we did it from very uh, kind of ugly conditions. We've been, you know, occupied, we've been Soviet zoo and with worst possible totalitarian experiences. And now we are one of the fastest growing EU economies. and. Uh, uh, EU is very popular and the whole reform package is very popular and our GDP grew I don't know from the signature of association agreement till accession in nine years six times mm -hmm. and just from membership so in from membership in EU till today two times again so it's like Obama President Obama was calling Baltic states in the recent summit We've been one of the kind of most successful transformation examples from very low levels in a, in, a, in a spectacular way developing. So we are trying to use our experience in, you know, in countries of, of MENA region. Not to forget Afghanistan, where little Lithuania uh, was running, well, the whole provincial reconstruction uh, team in Gor province and you know we've been the smallest country at all NATO member states to do it uh, with three million people only uh, uh, and we did it successfully 50 percent of our development cooperation budget was in Afghanistan we've been building schools and hospitals and roads and all the rest so little by little with I would say with this what I would say with, with this positive attitude no, we know that we can do it, uh, and we know that we can do it with those European and transatlantic instruments we have. Uh, so we try to ap apply it abroad, uh, and so we will try to contribute to that positive can-do attitude, I would say, in, in UN uh, as, as, as much as we can.
Right. Questions? Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, just going back to, uh, in terms of interaction, you had touched on tolerance um, and uh, within Lithuania, amongst the groups, religious tolerance, ethnic tolerance. How are these groups, um, are these groups uh, working together? Are they, today, are they interacting with one another? Um, uh, can you discuss that? Well, I would say yes. Uh, from the very beginning of uh, our independence 23 years ago, mm. we uh, approved very kind of inclusive legislation mm. uh, uh, on citizenship including. So all the ethnical group or religious groups, you know, who've been feeling part of Lithuania, uh, they were immediately accepted. Uh, and uh, really, we do not have any kind of internal uh, pressures or, or tensions. Mm -hmm. But, you know, being a diplomat for the last 20 years and, and for example, looking how you make it in America, I would, I would still love to, to do more with education. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, you know, is the focus of mm -hmm. this forum as well. Mm -hmm. We have great universities already. You know, we have, well, to compare with average of the European Union, 40% of Lithuanians, we have university education. So it's twice as big like an average in European Union. But I would think we need it more. It's not only quantity, it's also quality important. Uh, for example, in our case, because I think of that totalitarian experience, we don't have strong private institutions or universities, mm -hmm. you know, religious communities building it and competing with public schools and universities. And uh, it should be a priority because we are, the, we are the place that is very important geopolitically. That was always, you know, the center of different geopolitical fights. Mm -hmm. And we've been, you know, inter uh, encounter of different cultures or religions. To make it work, you need to invest into your mental ability to understand and move and, and glue it all. So uh, I think here we should really learn it. We should learn from American investment into, into human dignity, into, into person building, uh, into individuality. Mm -hmm because it, it helps you move, especially if you are different. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot rely only on public, state, whatever, big, mm -hmm. grand schemes. Every individual has to know how to maneuver. Uh, in, on this, we are not so good. Mm -hmm. And uh, civil society, including, okay. I think that's uh, not the trauma, but the result of transformation. We are very good with everything, economy is booming and right, so on, right. and innovations, and we are most, you know, we have five million operating cells and we are just three million, that's okay. But on human, cultural level, uh, civil society is not so strong in Central Europe to compare with, with the strongest maybe in the world, in America. Mm -hmm. So I would say half of, not half, okay, 30% of my time I'm trying to, to rebuild different kind of little networks that existed in pre-war Lithuania mm. and because of mm. one million of immigrants here, half a million in Chicago, they still have that hidden wall. So I try to reconvince them to rebuild it in Lithuania, but also learning from American organizations. I'm trying to lobby for them to establish little antennas in, in Lithuania and, you know, with Freedom House, NDI, IRI, with Reagan House, a lot of initiatives launched and they are function well. But I would love to have your forum in Lithuania. I'm serious. You know, your school, uh, you know, Turkish embassy is, is, is uh, operating as one of the strongest in Lithuania. But because of that, I would say ecumenical and, and tolerant environment, because of that historic impact we made on dialogue, uh, and because we are so important place, and if we are successful in bringing those dialogues and, and making this Europe whole and free further, you know, pushing those borders to the east, if you can say, we are the place where, you know, forums like you have to invest. So uh, I would love to help you to, to, to make at least, you know, one event in Vilnius. You test the ground 
and then you see maybe that's the place where you know where you have to share your experience in, in promoting those dialogues. Definitely. We'll take you up on that invitation, I believe. Yeah. So okay. I hope. Uh, yeah, I mean, civil society, this is, I mean, we know that this is, the, you know, the strength of a democracy. I mean, civil society not depending solely on the state uh, for things. Um, and it's, you know, uh, of course the state has responsibilities, uh, fundamental, um, but uh, definitely civil society um, is what will move, uh, it's my opinion, a country forward in, in terms of democracy and a, and a free society. Um, so uh, the success of the economy, uh, going back to the economy, uh, and so the European Union, the crash, um, you're very much affected by that, obviously, uh, as a country. Um, but now, doing very well. Um, so I would say even better than Turkey right now, who has been doing very well as well, just talking about Turkey. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and uh, the maybe some uh, you know, economic ties that you have with various countries in the region. Yeah. Uh, I would think that really part of the success is related with this cultural dimension and openness we have. Well, first of all, as I said, uh, education is important, hmm. though it could be even more important, but because of education, we have really very educated labor force. Uh, uh, Usually we have different American companies who are coming to our region and building little, little kind of headquarters mm -hmm. because when I ask them what's actually the best in Lithuania for you, we don't have you know, a lot of resources. Uh, they say people, they are the best. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so well-educated people, uh, people who've been as I said, who know why the liberty is important, mm -hmm. who suffered a lot, yeah. who fight for every centimeter of that freedom to be successful, who are very cautious with different kind of attempts to destroy it. So usually we have very good teams, very loyal people, very strategic and creative because to survive in the territory we survived and our statehood is already about 1,000 years in that territory. Mm -hmm. So you have to be smart. Also, we know a lot of languages. Mm. Uh, two, three, four. Mm. Uh, it's kind of okay. Uh, well, we still know Russian, uh, you know, French, German, English. People now are learning so much Scandinavian languages because Hmm. You know, we have Nordic banks and telecommunications okay. mostly, uh, and that's why we, where we get our innovations. So okay. I think another little success is this, I would say, Nordic phenomena hmm. of innovations, okay. uh, especially after global economic crisis. Be because we are well educated, kind of, we try to invest as a state to innovations. Mm. Uh, my prime minister was called Innovation Czar. He was circulating all around in Silicon Valley, hunting for the best, trying to attract. Uh, and already now, majority of our GDP is produced by services. You know, 23 years ago, it was you know, agriculture and all mm. other uh, uh, more traditional industries. Uh, but to summarize it all, people, culture, and ability mm you know, to, to interact. Though, European Union as well, because European Union created the context. Mm. Uh, but it, when now people are blaming in some countries the European Union because of those mm. little economic collapses, I think they're not sincere because it, it gives you an instruments. It gives you a lot of money. It gives you a lot of programs and ability. But that's your political judgment. What do you actually do with that? If you invest into cement, you know, it's one thing. If you invest into your brain, it's another thing. Uh, so because we learned very difficult lessons from the history, I think we are starting to make good investments with opportunities European Union is, is, is bringing. Yes, sir. Uh, can you, one minute, sorry, sorry. Just microphone, please. 
Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Ambassador. It's very interesting. Um, a hundred. I, I'm, I'm really struck by your recent, just the most, the latest comments about the uh, basically the human capital in Lithuania. Um, because I think if you had looked at when my ancestors came here in 1890, that. that Lithuania would have been seen as essentially uh, uh, maybe Vilnius and Kovno and the rest of it a, a, a essentially a peasant society and at a, quite a low level. So I, I'm interested in what made this transformation. It, maybe I'm incorrect, but I think, I think that's the view that most people would have had. It was a peasant society with a few cities quite well known, especially Vilnius. And I wonder, uh, you know, again, people talk about the contribution of the Soviet Union in, in the education area. And I'm wondering whether it's that or something else that has given you the human capital that you now think is the most important thing that you contribute. Well, we have those stereotypes. But I would say, well, just talking about the peasant society, it's not completely right because when you had this old empire of 500 years. No, your elite started to speak with different other languages. You know, in the very beginning, we've been using old Belarusian. Then we opted to Polish. And uh, a lot of elite kind of, you know, like it was happening in Sweden and in some other countries, uh, um, was kind of identifying themselves with some other cultures. But those were Lithuanians speaking Polish. You take the well-known General Kosciuszko standing in front of White House who had been fighting for American independence. He was our general. He was considering himself Lithuanian, always. You can mm. see it in all the documents. Yes, he was born outside the current territory of Lithuania, but then it was Lithuania. Yes, he was speaking Polish because then the whole elite was speaking Polish because we adopted Christianity through Poland, from marriage with <coughs> Polish princes. But he was considering himself Lithuanian. Like uh, Adam Mickiewicz, you know, famous Polish poet, but we consider him Lithuanian because he was considering himself Lithuanian. He graduated from the same Vilnius University, mm -hmm. my beloved university. He was always staying in this little church uh, of the university, and he was living just, you know, a few meters from there. Mm -hmm. So we were not peasant society. If you speak that Lithuanian language was more spoken in, in countryside, yes. But that happened everywhere in Europe, you know, with this ethnic, you know, identities. The culture, well, Lithuanian culture was resurfacing, you know, kind of, and being more and more used by elite from only 19th century. So kind of, well, first books printed l earlier. We've been all speaking Lithuanians, but elite was starting to use it only later. So, uh, so I think, and especially during Soviet occupation, Soviets, they immediately attacked in intelligent uh, kind of elite. Uh, deportations, you know, every third is kind of touched. Elite was, you know, taken out. So to say that Soviets brought us education, no, they killed our elite. <laughs> they deported it. Uh, it was a very difficult struggle. Uh, uh, I would say church again helped because actually Catholic church was harboring the resistance uh, so much. Uh, again, the religious cultural factor because remember, we've been the first in Soviet Union to, to make, to revolt against the Soviet Union. We've been the poles of the, Europe, of, of the Soviet Union, just we did it from inside. So, and maybe last point to answer why this education and human capital is important, I think because of resistance. Because you've been always have to fight for your freedom every day. You've been under attack all the time. You know, like Secretary Clinton, when she was in our community of democracy meeting in Vilnius, she said, look, I know that you Lithuanians know that you have for f to fight for freedom every day. People in the West forget it. 
because they live in kind of freedom. But they, they are very wrong because they think that if they stop fighting for freedom or stop fighting for democracy, nothing will happen and they will just run business peacefully. <laughs> no. Alternatives will come very quickly. We are the border of freedom somewhere. We see those alternatives every day. That's why we are very serious in preserving it. That's why, though, it, it sounds, I think, paradoxically, I say we are very educated, but I still say we need more. Yes, because we are the border of it, and we need more and more and more. It, it's the only way to survive. When Soviets occupied us for up to 20, 30,000 troops, they were fighting the Soviets. We had guerrilla resistance, mostly related with the church, mostly students, intellectuals, who been, who been making it, more, more or less all of them died. Nobody knows about that. You know, it's a hidden story. But that's because of human qualities. Uh, uh, you know, they resisted. We know that it is important to resist, and we still kind of continue doing it. And that's why today, when we see those transformations in Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, we are first to, 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 to run and help. Uh, because we know how painful they are. Even, you know, speaking about Russia. You know, we still remember those crowds of Russians marching in thousands in the street and asking Lithuanian freedom uh, some time ago. And today, you know, we help those freedom fighters uh, as much as we can because they are the real heroes, you know, who've been suffering of different kind of regimes for long years and they still continue doing it. So, you know, from people imprisoned, the names you know, you know, And they did it only because they are just great people. They, uh, they are not afraid to face authorita authoritarian regime who can simply kill you. So you have to be very brave and strong to resist it. People in the West do not face it. They live in wonderful conditions. So they forget about the basics. We don't. Mm. Wonderful point. Yes, sir. Mr. Ambassador, since uh, tolerance was, was a theme of your talk today, could you talk a little bit about um, the transition in independence in 1990 when Lithuania had a, a Russian minority uh, that was, was in residence in, in the country that it had to deal with? And how did, how did Lithuania deal with it uh, that, that might have been different than uh, Estonia or Latvia where, where the minority was even larger? I didn't want to be too specific because, you know, every state has its own conditions. We should, we should understand that, you know, those totalitarian consequences for Latvia and Estonia, they've been more difficult, you know. The suffering was big and, uh, and, uh, and uh, kind of changes that Soviet regime brought, they were deeper. So that's why you know i do not judge those countries uh, in our case we've been always fighting for our identity during soviet times including that's why we had this guerrilla resistance that functioned actually the last guerrilla warrior died in 67 can you imagine stalinist years finished in 53 you know but we've been always fighting with lithuanian americans like you helping us from here you know, with Lithuanian community, schools, you know, everything. So we preserved it during Soviet occupation. And that's why from the first days of independence, we granted citizenship to all Russians or Poles or, or Jews or, you know, anyone who feel comfortable with Lithuania. So I, I think that was our secret to, to success. And I was living in Vilnius on all my life. I am born in Vilnius. I, my, all my friends, were, they were Russians. I was playing with them. And when I, sometimes I'm coming back to this old Soviet strange building I was living in. And now I meet those friends and the kids of them. They all speak fluent Lithuanian. Mm -hmm. I'm asking them, why do, no, do not you keep your own identity? You know. They say, why? We, of course, do it 
you know, but you know, we are part of Lithuania. So culturally, there is no, there is no issue. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we accept the differences. We learned that this is important. We lost parts of uh, population. The Holocaust happened, and you know, but we try to rebuild those bridges right now. Uh, our citizenship law, though not maybe perfect, but if you trace your citizenship to pre-war Lithuania, you can kind of get it. And surprise, surprise, I'm, I'm also ambassador to Mexico. You have strong Litva community in Mexico City. Mm. And I suddenly understood that the biggest number of Lithuanians there, they are Litvaks, who have been, you know, who have synagogues in Mexico City, four of them. And when you enter those synagogues, you are kind of back in my own capital. You know, I see the streets, wow. I see the names. Mm. Uh, it's, so we try to rebuild mm. the bridges. And I think the European Union, this idea of Europe whole and free, this Eastern, Eastern Partnership Summit and Eastern Partnership process that first time during our presidency brought some results, it brings us an opportunity to, to rebuild that integrity and harmony that once existed in the region with all the nations living there. Mm. Uh, we have countries who are struggling against that vision, who are undermining it every day like a zero-sum game, you know, by punishing us economically, uh, culturally, you know, with all the means like they've been using during Soviet times. We know it. We've been living with this for a thousand years, but we will continue. And we know that we will win because this model you know, of tolerance and human dignity and integrity. It's simply you have no better alternative. Yes, we have deficiencies. We talked about that. We are not so serious with something uh, that is not helping us to bring it even stronger. But I really dream and I know that we can do it. We can recreate this transatlantic family with trade deals we launched by learning from each other, but also learning the differences that we will meet on that road. And if we, as, you know, if we have you know, that internal force to learn the differences, to build those bridges, then we can really make that world better. If we are not, if we are closing ourselves from the world, if, if we are kind of trying to pretend that we have no differences and kind of we are just economic consumer beings and we just make economy, that's bad. That's a very short-sighted. And that's the kind of difference I was, I was working in Brussels for three and a half years, and now I'm here for three years. I have to recognize, here in America, you feel that strategy from every corner. You know, because people think global here. Still, still. In Europe, it's more regional. You know, we're kind of losing that strategic vision. We. You know, during the times of John Paul II, when the Berlin Wall was falling, uh, oh, that was a great time and romanticism was up. You know, after two decades, it kind of disappeared, but that's wrong. Because we have millions of Europeans and or people other than Europeans waiting for that stability and kind of society similar to the society that is built here. We have to have a grand vision. We have to have brave to face it. And being, you know, country who suffered so much and but now transformed so well, we think that we can do it. On that note, very good note. Um, thank you very much. It's been a wonderful yeah. conversation.